this over to everybody who is on the webinar and we'll get started. Okay, well, I hope everybody's having a good afternoon as today is Tuesday. Um, so Rob, the first question I have for you is, are there any ramifications in bringing back less staff? Thank you very much, Julie. Um, and, and I'm going to answer that on the premise that the folks who are not going to be brought back um, are going to be separated or terminated. In other words, we're not just going to leave them out to return in, a, in another day. Um, and assuming that's the case uh, and that you're only get, you're going to then continue to operate with just fewer employees going forward, um, there are a couple of things we'd recommend you think about as you're going through that process. Um, in effect, this is not unlike uh, a reduction in force uh, or a restructuring. And um, you're now looking at how are we going to do the work we need to do with fewer people. And in any situation like that, we encourage employers to basically take a uh, snapshot or look at a snapshot of their workforce before the decision was made and then compare that to what it's going to look like afterwards. And if they, uh, if the after looks substantially different than before, you might want to ask yourself why that is, particularly if you find that certain groups um, have been significantly impacted by um, the decision to bring back less staff. For example, um, if we uh, have 12 African Americans in our workforce of uh, 75 people, and we decide going forward we're only going to have 40 uh, employees, um, why was it that 11 of the 12 African Americans were not brought back? Or same with, say, women, uh, folks over 40 versus under 40, <laughs> things like that. Um, and, and determine if that is in fact the case, is there a legitimate business reason for the decisions that have been made to not bring back certain people? And if there are, um, you know, you have to be prepared to, uh, to make them if somebody wants to question why this was. Um, you also wanna look at things like, um, if you're subject to the Family and Medical Leave Act, um, were uh, folks who took FMLA um, recently, I'll say within the last six months, maybe even the last year, you know, uh, have, do we have a number of those on the list of folks who will not be brought back? Um, same with folks who otherwise might have engaged in some sort of protected activity under one of the employment mm -hmm. laws, whether it's requesting an accommodation under the ADA, um, maybe opposing discrimination or harassment, or pay inequities, things like that. Um, are those folks on the list of employees who are not going to be brought back? And again, if so, can we back up our decision um, if push comes to shove? Um, having done any of those things um, doesn't necessarily guarantee a job, um, but um, the employer does need to be prepared to, to substantiate or justify its decision. Um, something else to think about uh, is if you uh, were an employer um, or still are an employer with over 100 employees and you have at least 50 employees who are not going to be uh, going to be brought back, have we now tripped over the WARN Act, the Worker Adjustment Retraining Notification Act that deals with mass layoffs and plant closings? Uh, and in order to have a mass layoff, uh, you've got to have at least 50 employees at a single site and at least one third of the employees at that site uh, who have been laid off for at least six months or whose employment has been terminated. So if you get into significant numbers like that, you may, you may have to be mindful of the WARN Act. Um, and now have we, um, do we have some sort of a notification obligation uh, that we should have met before we made the decision not to bring people back? Um, and then just a couple of sort of logistical issues I would mention is um, if you have decided not to bring folks back, but yet provide them with some sort of severance benefits as a way to help them transition to whatever their next opportunity might be. Um, there are, uh, of course, special rules for folks who are over the age of 40. And whenever you have a group pro uh, termination program or a group separation program, there are yet additional uh, rules that have to be complied with, and you'll want to get some guidance and make sure you're 
you're doing that so that you can get an, an enforceable waiver of certain types of uh, uh, legal claims that might come down the road. Um, then finally, I, of course, uh, you can never um, go through something like this without being mindful of some of the benefit issues that might come up. And I'm going to kind of segue this over to Norbert uh, to talk about some of them. But, you know, certainly um, if folks have unused vacation um, that they have not, um, that they still have sort of in the bank. And if your policy your specifically says that they are paid unused vacation upon termination, that is going to be something you're going to have to do. Uh, of course, when it comes to things like welfare benefits, that's more in Norbert's bailiwick than mine. So maybe I'll just kick it over to him to, to talk a little bit about what may happen at that point with those benefits. Right. Well, thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, the issue, I think, if, um, if you've continued any benefits for employees uh, during, you know, uh, you know, a temporary layoff or anything like that, if you're not bringing them all back, um, some of those employees will probably may have some COBRA rights um, if you as an employer are subject to COBRA. So just keep that in mind and you may have to provide notification to your COBRA administrator to make sure that those people get their COBRA notices. We'll talk later on about continuation of benefits during a layoff, so I'm not going to, you know, go, go too deeply into it right now, but uh, just think about rights that people have if they're losing benefits um, or you're terminating them about the rights that they may have with respect to those benefits. So I'll turn it back to you, Julie. Thank you. Robert, do you have another question for you? When businesses start bringing back employees, what are the do's and don'ts? Yeah, and, and this uh, actually could be the subject of a whole separate <laughs> uh, webinar or, or Zoom meeting. Um, and and uh, I apologize for the shameless plug, but um, uh, we do have some folks, folks from our firm tomorrow morning who are going to be doing a free webinar on this very topic mm -hmm. from 11 a.m. to 12 uh, noon. So if you um, do want to, I think, dive deeper into this than I'm going to, I would encourage you to visit our website. Um, there is a special section on COVID-19. Uh, I think if you look down to the labor and employment section, you'll see uh, tomorrow uh, morning that that program is there and you can sign up for it because they'll go through a lot of this stuff in a lot more detail than really we really have time here to do today. Um, but in a general sense, um, uh, there's uh, a number of things I, I would say that you're going to have to give some consideration to. And it, so if you're not to this point of bringing people back yet, you know, I would encourage you to start thinking about that. One is going to be sort of what are the basic uh, safety protocols or pr procedures you're going to have in place uh, relative to personal protective equipment, uh, social distancing, hand washing, just cleaning of the facility and, and uh, additional sanitization efforts that are gonna take place, infection control, things like that. Those are all gonna be very important. Uh, the governor on Friday issued a new executive order um, and in anticipation of starting to relax some of these uh, restrictions that have been in place, said that um, for employers who have employees working or who are gonna be returning employees to work, one of the things that they must do is at least provide uh, some sort of non-medical face covering to their employees. And we've had a lot of questions from a lot of clients about this uh, and exactly what that means. Um, but the order uh, is very specific that, that the employer's obligation is to provide those things there is no requirement in the order that you require people to wear them. You just have to make them available. And we contrast that with a, an executive order the governor issued on Saturday dealing with um, grocery stores and pharmacies. In that order, she very specifically said that employers must require their um, uh, public facing employees to wear face coverings. So they're certainly, uh, they're, they're keen to the distinction, I guess, if you will, in Lansing between providing things to employees and making them wear them. Now, um, although the order doesn't go that far and require that you do that, um, I guess you wanna consider as sort of a best practice whether you do, in fact, say to your employees, you know, we, uh, we do require that you wear these. And I am surprised at uh, the number of emails and questions I got just really over the weekend and yesterday 
from employers who said, we have employees who just absolutely refuse to wear a face mask or a face covering. Um, and sometimes there are um, legitimate medical reasons for that. Um, other times it's, I would say, more operational or practical, like they fog up your safety glasses or something. Um, and then other times they're just folks who say, yeah, you know, I'm not going to wear a mask. Um, and so you have to be prepared to have that conversation if you're going to make that a requirement for your employees. Um, and like so many things during this time, and, and we probably will touch upon this later uh, through our, our talk, and that is if somebody uh, refuses to wear a mask or refuses to return to work, you know, are you prepared to tell that employee, this is a, this is a condition of employment. You either do this or you don't work here. Um, and that's very easy for people like me to say, but you all have businesses um, and agencies to run. And um, it is not easy to find people right now. You, if you thought it was hard three months ago to hire employees, it is a lot harder right now. Why? Because nobody's out looking for a job. They really can't be out looking for a job. Um, so you, you have to be prepared for the operational consequences of that and, and how you're going to deal with that. Um, uh, something else that the governor has um, instructed employers to do in her executive order is to prepare a COVIDness uh, pre preparedness and response plan. And that requires you to really look at your facility, what are the risks, what are the exposure potentials, um, and put in place, <clears throat> excuse me, protocols for how to minimize those risks. Um, and that is um, something that really does take a sort of uh, facility by facility or office by office analysis. It's not something you should just download something off the internet, slap your name on it and put it in place and put it in a drawer. Uh, you really do need to, to think about it and, and actually put it into practice. Um, and, and I know our folks tomorrow in the webinar are gonna spend a lot of time talking about that. So uh, that, that I encourage you, if you have the time tomorrow to, to listen in on that, I think you'll get a lot of very helpful information. Um, you, you would want to think, or you're going to need to think about how many employees do we really truly physically need to be at the office, at the plant, uh, to, to do what needs to be done, and how many employees or which employees can we continue to allow to work remotely uh, or to, to telecommute. Um, the, uh, certainly the governor's uh, thinking through this is that you should only bring back the bare minimum number of employees that you need to do the work that needs to be done. And in some cases, that may mean you have certain work that you have identified as, as critical, or your uh, customers have said, this is part of the critical infrastructure, a term that I'm sure we've all heard. Um, and uh, you may need to bring those employees back to do that work, while you may have other folks working in other plants or on other lines where it is not uh, so essential or so critical those folks you may just leave off uh, from work. Um, but that too will be something to, to give some thought to. And then once you get them back, how do we, as best we can, try to socially distance people from one another? Uh, will we have to put in place plexiglass uh, guards between workstations, things like that? So there are some actual physical modifications that you might need to be thinking about relative to the, uh, to the workplace. I saw something on 60 Minutes on Sunday, uh, where I think it might have been Ford or GM that was making uh, respirators. And they set up a, a, a line and between each person's workstation, there were big plexiglass uh, screens, if you will, or partitions. Um, and and uh, I can only imagine what the challenge is trying to get plexiglass nowadays. So if, if that's something you think you need to do, you, you may want to be trying to source that as quickly as possible. Um, then you'll need to think about people actually entering your office or entering your facility. And are you going to be doing any sort of screening for those people? Um, most, uh, all of the employers that I have worked with, including those or especially those who have continued to work through this uh, shutdown uh, period, um, have implemented a process whereby before folks report to work, they are screened at least with a series of questions. Do you have a temperature of over 100.4 degrees? Do you have a, a cough? Do you have a fever? 
Uh, have you had any atypical shortness of breath? Um, any loss of taste or smell? Things like that. Um, and then they have uh, also implemented uh, touchless um, temperature readings with a, um, a, a, a thermometer, if you will, um, that they have also required employees to go through that process. And obviously, if someone answers one of the questions with, yes, I have a fever, yes, I have a cough, or something like that, or if, if their temperature is over 100.4 degrees, they're turned around and not allowed to return uh, for some period of time until they're able to and symptom free. Um, but those will be additional measures that you're going to have to think about uh, and put in place. Um, and then um, uh, I guess the real challenging situation, um, and I'm, uh, I was very fortunate, I think, for the first maybe three, four weeks of this whole uh, crisis, not to have um, very many questions like this, but starting last week and already this week, uh, I've had a number of employers call who have said, well, we now have our first confirmed positive case of COVID-19 in our plant, and this person had worked recently. What do we do? Um, and you need to have in place a process and a protocol and a communication plan for what you're going to do in those situations. Um, and to, on that note, and I, I don't want to try to go through everything because, I, again, I think in the interest of time, um, we want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to, um, to talk about what they need to talk about. But um, the uh, governor in Executive Order 2020-36 said that if someone has been in close contact, which is defined as within six feet for a prolonged period of time, which isn't really defined, unfortunately, but if they've been in close contact with somebody who has tested positive for COVID-19, that they are supposed to stay home and not report to work for 14 days from their last contact. So if you envision a, um, uh, a, an assembly line or a work uh, place where folks are in relatively close uh, proximity to one another, um, if you get somebody who has worked recently and then who goes off work for a couple of days and calls you and says, guess what, I've tested positive. You now need to do some uh, contact tracing with them to figure out who did they have or who were they in close contact with. Um, because we may now need, uh, not we will not only be down one employee, but we may, may now need to send um, many other employees home uh, for up to 14 days from when they last had contact with that coworker. Um, and uh, that obviously can have significant operational considerations for you. Um, so something that you'll definitely want to be thinking about. Uh, and again, the, the folks tomorrow on our, our webinar, I know are going to talk in a lot more detail about that. But hopefully that gives you enough to be sick about and to, you know, worry you and keep you awake tonight uh, as you decide what you're going to do. Um, but that's just kind of a quick overview of some of the things to be thinking about. Thank you. Um, so, Quentin, what do employers need to know about providing a safe workplace and a safe workforce in the in the post quarantine economy? Yeah, thanks, Julie. I think I think Robert touched on a lot of this too, so I think it, it coincides nicely with some of his comments. Um, but to to start out, I think the best thing to do is it you know it makes sense to have a designated team that's going to focus on providing a safe workplace, implementing a safe workplace, and then maintaining it. So. That team might be a subset of your crisis management or business continuity team, or it might be something entirely new. But I think having that team created to specifically focus on, on these policies, procedures, and implementation, I think that's going to be key as you move forward. So I'll dive a little bit deeper on a few of Robert's comments, kind of breaking this into two areas, one focusing on policy, procedure, and communication, and the other focusing a little bit more on the physical facility and, and some things that you can implement to make your employees feel safe and, and make them safer as, as they come back into the workforce. From a policy and procedure perspective, I think accessibility to information is going to be key, especially if you've essentially been shut down for the last month and a half. So if, if there's been limited remote work occurring as well, I think you know as you bring employees back, make information accessible to them that, that they need to be aware of as they enter the facility. So things like the FFCRA posters, Post those in visible places, make sure employees have the information they need. 
if you're going to have kind of this tiered structure of return to work where some employees are coming on site and others are going to remain part of the remote workforce, consider sending out an email with the posters, posting it to the company intranet, just making a lot of information available to your employees. And then the other focus here is going to be your policies and procedures, obviously taking into account your individual state's requirements, but review and revise a number of things like hiring practices and, and policies, taking into consideration the fact that you may need to onboard people during this next couple of month and period of time where we're kind of new in, in, in getting back into the workforce. You know, consider a revision start to finish of your hiring practices. Consider looking at things like work from home and, and child care policies. As we, as we slowly tiptoe back into the workforce, we know that that coronavirus is still out there, that the contact with it will probably still occur. And so, you know, similar to some of the things that Rob, Robert mentioned, um, there may still be some of your employees that come into contact with it and have to adhere to a 14 day quarantine, you know, ease the restrictions or, or ease the ability of, of work from home and then also ease the ability to work from home for childcare purposes. Uh, many schools, I know locally here in Michigan, and I'm, I'm sure in other states, you know, they're shut down for the rest of this year and students are learning at home virtually. So make sure that you, you accommodate that and that your staff can work from home as needed to care for their, their children as well. Another policy to, to pay close attention to is your work travel policy. Um, I, I think many of us travel on a pretty regular basis now for work. Consider looking at that and implementing tools and technology that we've probably learned a lot about over the past month and a half. I think the benefit here is that many companies have been using things like we are today, Zoom or Microsoft Teams, whatever it might be. But for this first couple of months, consider using that technology a little bit more than having some of your road warriors, you know, get back on, on planes and, and start traveling. One last thing I'll touch on here, I think Brad's going to touch on this a little bit too, um, review rehire and reinstate provisions for benefit policies. So things like eligibility, waiting periods, check in and see how lockdown and, and potential layoffs and rehires have been impacted um, by the last you know, month, month and a half or so. Overarching all of this, and I think to supplement it all from a policy and procedure perspective is, is communication. You know, make sure you're distributing new and revised policies to employees. I think that goes without saying, but provide open, open communication forums, potentially week, weekly meetings where they can ask questions and, and get answers. I think it's gonna make everybody feel you know, as safe as possible and, and mitigate stress levels. Also consider not just the internal communication you're going to have over the next month, month and a half. I think companies are doing a good job at this, but as a reminder, as you start implementing things at your facility, you know, consider the communication response plans that you're going to send out to your external partners as well. You know, um, Robert touched on, on, on taking temperatures, if, if that is something that, you know, you choose to do or asking screening questions when um, employees enter your office, but also consider too, what will you be doing as, as external business part to partners enter your, your facility as well? On that note, switching gears to facility, what are some things that you can do to really prep your facility to be ready for workers to return? I think starting out, again, education, maybe provide some, whether it's virtual or in very small groups, distance groups, provide some training. So maybe something as simple as how to wear a face cloth or how to utilize maybe some of the, the um, the facility enhancements that you've put in place. I think it's uh, just that extra step to make sure everybody follows and adapts to this new normal. The other, the other thing I would say, you know, to look at before having workers return, um, OSHA has a fantastic, they, they're calling it the uh, occupational risk pyramid for uh, COVID-19. And essentially what it is, is it's a pyramid that's a classification system. And what you can do is you can essentially classify your employees into this pyramid based on their roles and responsibilities, you can figure out low, medium, high, what their risk is and what their risk tolerance is going to be to coronavirus. And so I think that this, using this risk pyramid, you'll be able to not just classify your workers, but there's also on there some recommendations for each classification on the most effective personal protection equipment that they can utilize and then different controls and practices that you can put into place. And so highly recommend you take a peek at, at OSHA's website for that. If you need help with it, let us know. I think that's going to be a great tool as you start to prepare workers for coming back. It'll help you get a good gauge on where there might be more points of risk. Um, Robert talked a little bit about sanitation, you know, obviously accessibility to hand sanitation products, things like surface wipes, 
you know, I think we've probably all had some of these in our workplace, restrooms, uh, kitchen, common areas, but taking that next step and, and placing it all over the office, the more accessible it is and the more out in front of individuals it is, I think the more likely everyone's going to be to, to take that extra step and, and utilize these things. A lot of us probably in the past, you shared equipment. I mean, open, open concept workplaces is obviously extremely popular these days and not even having a desk sharing equipment is pretty common, but where possible, try to mitigate and avoid that altogether. And then if not, you know, provide sanitation protocols to, to help out in, in, in those cases. Um, social distancing is going to be, I think, a big change for everyone. You know, we, uh, we, we collaborate in many different ways in the workplace, but as we start to return, institute new limits uh, on gather in gathering places like common areas and then conference rooms. Maybe there's new policies and procedures for how conference rooms are going to be utilized, but consider some things that you can institute to, to mitigate the number of people in some of these areas. It might be as, you know, going as far, and I think Robert mentioned this too, modify shift structures. You know, stagger shifts to have enough people on site to meet business needs, but also to meet the, the health and social distancing requirements uh, that, that are being created. And then redesign your workspace if needed. It might mean moving desks and, and repositioning things so that the collaborative environment isn't lost, but that there is also still some distance there uh, between employees. Operationally, definitely look into the personal protection equipment that's going to protect your workforce the most. It might be as simple as face cloth and coverings, but there might be specific equipment that is a little bit more relevant and needed for your job's hazards. You know, if you're in a manufacturing facility, uh, dentistry, or some other operation where aerosols by nature of your operation are going to be generated uh, more frequently, consider, you, consider using, uh, you know, powered air purifying respirators or something that goes above and beyond just a simple face cloth and, and gloves. The OSHA and CD site, CDC sites have some fantastic recommendations around this, but you know, don't hesitate to reach out, out to us as well. Um, consider too some engineering controls. So this will be you know, more focused on facility uh, enhancement and modification, but you know, things such as high efficiency air filters, if you can you know, implement measures to increase ventilation rates in the work environment, really a number of things that you might have to modify within your facility, but ultimately provide as safe as possible a workplace for your, your returning employees. You know, the last thing I'll touch on stepping away from policy procedure and even stepping away from facility is, you know, provide accessibility to employee assistance programs. I think that, you know, this has been critical over the last month and a half and companies are doing a good job on it, but don't lose sight of, of the importance of, of providing mental health resources and, that, that additional assistance to employees as they return to the workforce. I think it's going to be a new stress as we enter this normal. And so consider communicating the types of assistance programs that you have available for your employees so that they're well aware of where to turn for support as they re-enter the facility. Makes sense, thank you. Um, also, Quentin, could you touch a little bit on business interruption and what's covered and what's not? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> that's a challenging question right now. There, there are a couple of moving parts to this. I think we're all probably becoming very aware that it's, it's really not a black and white answer right now. Um, you know, if we want to focus on what's covered and what's not, I think we can address the elephant in the room. Uh, you know, COVID-19, while policies uh, are going to differ in coverage language and, you know, they're going to have different exclusions, Largely, COVID-19 is, is not a covered cause of loss when we're talking about business interruption. However, you know, I think in, in this situation, since it is unprecedented, we, we do need to take a step back and we need to look past what, what the surface language says because you know, we've had unprecedented situations before events like 9-11, events like Katrina, where government intervention has changed the trajectory on, on what might have been the traditional um, um, interpretation of that coverage. So right now, you know, instead of focusing on what's covered, what's not, I think uh, from a procedural perspective as a business, what I would focus on, focus on is, is what can I control right now and what can I do, you know, to, to at least cover my bases in the event somehow coverage is provided. And the best way to do that is to submit a claim. So, you know, uh, get, contact your insurance broker, gather the information needed, submit a claim, receive your reservation of rights letter, and then take next steps based on what your insurance carrier 
uh, you know, lays out for you. I think, you know, it's going to mitigate work for you and it, it's, it's going to at least be the most you can do in, in this type of situation. I say that because you're probably going to hear maybe some additional feedback around, make sure you're tracking ongoing expenses, make sure you track additional expenses. It's all well and good, but you know, if your insurance carrier is ultimately going to deny the claim, you're going to be out those hours. And so, you know, at least just to start things, submit a claim and then, and then take it step by step uh, from there as, as you receive communication from your insurance carrier. Sounds like a plan. Thank you. Norbert, is there any, is there, I'm sorry, is there healthcare coverage for laid off or furlough employees? Yeah. So the place to start there is really to look at your plan document. Um, there's, there's, you know, your plan document, your, most employers are subject to ERISA and your plan document is kind of a controlling document, almost kind of like a contract that's enforceable by your employees and by the government, uh, things like that. So, you know, you really want to start by looking there. If you're an employer that has like routine seasonal layoffs, you, are, you may have a provision in your contract that deals with, you know, temporary layoffs or furloughs. And if you do, you, you would want to follow those rules. Um, but if you don't have those kinds of provisions, and most plans I'd say do not, um, then what your contract, what your plan document probably says is that uh, if, you know, if somebody goes on a layoff, uh, that they probably lose eligibility either on the date that the layoff begins or at the end of the month in which the layoff begins. Um, and, and there may be different outcomes for different kinds of benefits. Maybe there's continuation under the health plan, but people lose benefits under, you know, dental and vision or life or disability or something like that. So you need to look at all of your benefit programs and understand what's happening there. So if your plan doesn't allow for continuation, you have a couple of options. First, you could adopt a temporary amendment of your plan document uh, to allow for continuation of some or all benefits uh, during the, uh, the layoff. Um, if you do that, uh, make sure you, you first talk to your insurers, okay, because you've got a contract with your insurer, and if the contract doesn't allow for that continuation of benefits, you're going to be, you're going to be stuck if somebody has a claim. Uh, so what you want to make sure is you first, you know, run it by your insurers. A lot of health insurers have indicated that they're going to allow you to continue benefits for your employees, but, but make sure that all of your, all of your insurers are on board, or at least all the insurers for whom you want to continue the benefits. Um, and, um, you know, think also about putting some uh, parameters around how long you're going to do it, right? You want to define in a written document how long you're going to continue benefits. And if somebody isn't recalled within that time period, you know what happens. And typically that would be that they would lose their benefits, but they could elect COBRA at that point uh, if you're subject to, to COBRA. Um, another alternative that you could consider um, if you are subject to COBRA is instead of continuing benefits you know, as active employees, you could um, offer to subsidize COBRA premiums for a certain period, maybe two or three months as an example. Um, you know, again, here, um, you know, you'd want to, again, put in writing, you know, the parameters of the program, you know, who's, who's going to be eligible for the subsidy, how long it will continue, things like that. I think you also want to think about is whether you have people, you know, elect COBRA at the start or if you think you're just going to opt everybody in and then, you know, what, what, will, ha what will happen at the end of the, the time period? Do you make them elect COBRA to continue or something else? I would suggest you talk with your COBRA administrator about that. Uh, they'll probably have some ideas and preferences about how they think you should do that. Um, and you'll probably have to modify COBRA communications, either, you know, the letter that goes out or at least a supplement to that letter uh, to explain people what happens. Um, you may have employees who are not going to uh, have continuation of, of benefits, either because uh, they're not in a group that you consider be a temporary layoff, or maybe you're, you're, you're just deciding not to do a continuation of benefits uh, during a temporary layoff. Well, if you bring those people back, um, something to think about, again, is what does your plan document say about um, restoring them to benefits? Um, if the layoff has been uh, for a short period of time, your plan document may require that you immediately reinstate them. Um, if they've been gone for a longer period of time, 
your plan document may say that uh, they are subject, you know, that they're treated like new employees. And if you have a waiting period to get into your plan, they may be subject to that waiting period. If you want to overrule those kinds of rules, uh, then you've got to probably do it by an amendment and you need to talk to your insurers to make sure that they're on board also. Because the last thing you want the insurer to do is balking at paying a claim um, that you thought would be covered. And if the insurer balks from paying it, then you might, might be on the hook for it under ERISA. So those are things to think about there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And going on some more benefits, Brad, if an employee has already met their deductible for the year and gets laid off, does that apply to the coverage they may get on their own? Thanks, Julie. Uh, yeah, this is a, a question that we were getting uh, quite commonly uh, in the beginning of all of this. So the short answer is no, uh, typically. So there has been recent changes with this, and this is why we wanted to bring this up today. Uh, we are starting to get communication from some of these carriers that they will honor prior met deductibles if you're going from a group plan to an individual plan. So Norma just shared some information about different options with COBRA, et cetera, and some employees might find a better option, depending upon their age, to go out to the marketplace direct. Uh, I would encourage anyone to contact the insurance company that they're with today by the 800 number on the back of their card and ask for a conversion option. Uh, specifically, they want to look at that deductible carryover. And before you do that legwork, I would encourage anyone to uh, see exactly what you've met in that deductible. One option is calling the 800 number on the back of the card. You will have a wait for that for immediate information. I would uh, in, in, log into your app on your phone or enroll online uh, and you can pull your most recent explanation of benefits for this plan year or for calendar year depending upon when your deductible accumulation is. If you see that you've got the, a deductible credit, then I would take that next step and, and contact that insurer. You'll know what the COBRA premium is and then compare that against an individual plan and potentially roll over that deductible credit. Uh, in some cases, uh, it could make sense to remain with the COBRA, depending upon your age and the, the coverage uh, uh, benefit levels. So it is a very common question, but it, there has been a lot of changes recently, which is why we wanted to bring it up today. Perfect, thank you. We did have a couple questions come in the chat. I wanna get answered before we go to the other questions that I have. Um, do you guys know what is the max allowed temperature for a staff member before they can be sent home? Do you have that information off the top of your head? Uh, well, I'll chime in. I'm, I'm not aware that there is a maximum. Uh, it, it, from everything I have seen from uh, the CDC, uh, the state of Michigan, uh, I believe OSHA as well, they've all sort of used a 100.4 degrees sort of benchmark. So that tends to be the, uh, I, I think the most common trigger that employers use. Um, having said that, uh, an employer certainly would be within its rights to adopt something lower than that. Um, although you'd have to appreciate that some folks may just run hot and um, you may be sending home a, you know, an otherwise perfectly healthy individual. Uh, I don't know that I would go any higher than that, quite frankly, in as much as all of the informed guidance seems to, to peg to that 100.4 um, uh, 100 degrees. Okay, thank you. And then would it be a HIPAA violation if a business took the non-contact temperature so with the, the regular thermometer, I'm assuming, um, of all employees as they enter the work, workplace and if the employees are lined up properly distanced to get their temps taken, um, are we turn, can we turn away someone for a fever? All right, so let me start with the HIPAA question, right? I mean, it's a privacy issue. Mm -hmm. um, so HIP, it, actually HIPAA probably doesn't even apply in this case because you're not collecting this for a health plan purpose, okay? But 
there are other privacy laws out there that would apply. There's privacy requirements under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the FMLA, uh, there's the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. All of these laws have implications for data that you, health information that you collect from your workforce, okay? So they don't prohibit you from collecting you know, temperature information from people as they walk through the door. But what they do say is that you have to treat that information confidentially. Okay, you cannot keep that information in your, uh, in your personnel record. You have to keep it in a separate health record. And you can use the same record that you use for your FMLA and ADA records, but you just need to make sure that that's kept for confidential, you know, kept confidentially and not used for other purposes. Okay. Uh, and I, I would just add real quickly, if I may, um, you'll, you'll want to give some consideration to if someone does um, show a temperature of say uh, over a 100.4 degrees and you then realize we're going to have to send this person home, it's probably a good idea to think about how you're going to have that conversation and how you're going to do that without making them do the walk of shame back past all their coworkers um, after right. they've shown a higher temperature. So um, the same would apply if, if you're going to ask them the series of questions that I generally outlined earlier you know, do you do that one-on-one, -on -one? Um, and and how do you handle the individual who may answer a question such that you you conclude you've got to send them home? Okay. And then, um, can an office take non-contact temperature of walk-in customers? Are they allowed to do that? Well, I'll I'll chime in on this. This is a little above my pay grade, uh, <laughs> and and as a laborer and employment lawyer, that's not a very high pay grade. So I, I fully admit we're the we're the gym teachers of the legal world. You know, no offense <laughs> to the gym teachers out there, but um, um, uh, I I I did see that question pop up when it came in, and um, I don't know why you could not do that uh, from a legal perspective, um. I think you obviously may have some customer relations considerations you want to take into effect. Um, and, and as much as you'd hope that folks would understand why you're doing that, um, you know, there is always the possibility that someone will not at all be happy about that. And, you know, will claim, well, I just got done working out or I jogged over here or something like that. And that's the reason my temperature is so high, but I'm, I'm not off the top of my head aware of any uh, legal restrictions on, on employers doing that, um, at, at least at this time. Right. And, and I wouldn't really rely just on temperature, right? Because somebody might be asymptomatic um, and still have the disease, right? So, I mean, if you are doing that with your customers, you know, keep in mind that there's other, you know, protections you also ought to have in place, like limiting how many people you allow in your shop, in your store, or your place of business at a time, you know, maintaining social distancing with the people and things like that as well. I mean, don't, don't view as taking a temperature as, you know, the, the only safeguard that you need to use because it's not. Right. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, more people are chiming in over here. So I was just trying to make sure I was reading their questions as they were coming in. Um, can, or I'm sorry, if an employee who was recently tested for COVID-19 antibodies and it comes back positive and his doctor suspects that the virus, he got the virus back in January, is that company required to notify the employees? And, and by that I'm, I'm assuming notify other employees yes. uh, that, of that. Um, obligated, no. Um, I, I know that many of the employers I deal with right now, uh, even though they may not be under a legal obligation to do something, are uh, in the interest of, I'll say, transparency or uh, positive employee relations are, are probably over communicating in some respects or sharing um, over sharing information uh, within, you know, reasonable uh, restrictions with employees because they know they're not only communicating with the employee, but they're communicating with the employee's families who may be even more concerned or as concerned as the employee is, is that they're, you know, they're coming out and going to work. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would say that's probably more of an employee relations consideration. Um, than it is a, a legal one, but Norbert did, uh, I think, touch on the fact that when you set HIPAA aside, um, you know, we, we do have other 
uh, guidance uh, out there and privacy considerations, um, either under Michigan's common law or under some of the other um, federal non-discrimination laws. And the, and the EEOC has generally taken the position that even though COVID um, uh, or antibodies, you know, may not constitute a disability, you should treat the medical information you receive relative to that the same as you should treat um, information related to someone who has an actual disability and may be seeking an accommodation. In other words, you should only disclose that to folks, um, supervisors, and folks who otherwise have a legitimate business reason to know and not just generally willy-nilly you know, sharing it with other employees. So I'm afraid no perfect answer to that. And that's a tough mm -hmm. scenario when you think, you know, somebody could be three months or four months removed from maybe actually having the virus. Um, so I, I, I don't know that I can give you a hard and fast yes or no answer to that one. Okay. Right. I, I think there's also a business continuity issue here as well, right? It's not just an employee relations issue, but, you know, if you find out that somebody has tested positive, um, you probably need to identify other people in your workforce who may have been exposed to isolate them so that it doesn't spread through the rest of your workforce, right? So I think there's the practical issue of, your, you know, of trying to keep your business running by isolating people as necessary so that they're not further infecting other people. Okay. So I'm going to ask the other questions that we received prior to the webinar, and then I will hopefully get back to the questions that are keep chiming in in the chat. We have about uh, 15 minutes left here. So Rob, how does the Michigan UIA pay out weekly benefits to work share employees? Will the payments go to the employees via direct deposit? And if so, how does the UIA obtain the employee's direct deposit information? since this is not requested during the work share application or certification process. And um, they go on to say that they understand the employer requirements, but the missing piece is what happens after the work share plan is approved and the certifications have been reported by the employer. Um, and that was actually a question. It's not often I have to ask my clients for answers. Uh, they usually call me to, uh, with questions, but I actually had to reach out to a a company I work with um, uh, who was on a work share arrangement prior to uh, the shutdown um, mm -hmm. to uh, sort of understand the logistics of, of how that payment process works. And um, it was explained to me that the, the default, if you will, is that the individual uh, receives basically sort of like a payroll debit card that is um, tied to an account that the UIA funds and they would uh, load that with benefits um, when, the in, when and if the individual is entitled to it. If the individual, however, wanted to have that, those funds direct deposited into uh, their bank account or their checking account, um, that actually has to be accomplished through the, um, uh, the phone system that the UIA operates. And I'm gonna kind of run down the steps that she outlined for me. Um, and uh, hopefully those of you who are familiar with this, because this is an area as lawyers, we don't get uh, too involved in, but um, when you call the, uh, the unemployment agency, um, you know, you, you'll get a series of prompts, press one for English, two for something else. Uh, and then there is a, uh, the next uh, query is press two to change payment. Um, and then uh, after that, it'll say select one, option one to cha actually change your payment. It then asks for the individual's nine digit social security number. Um, uh, and then it also uh, asks them to create a four digit PIN number. Um, then enter their birth date. So there's gonna be a lot of pressing of keys uh, involved. Um, and then it will say, please select your payment option. Um, and if you select a direct deposit into uh, a bank account, it then asks you for the routing number um, and the account number uh, into which the account needs to go. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then Quinton, does a business need to carry workers' compensation insurance if employees are currently not or if employees are not currently working and if rehires are not planned to um, be joining back in the near future? 
Yeah, you know, this is going to be a case by case type of question. And, and I think there's more parameters around it, you know, than just do we or do we not need to carry workers comp because we don't have workers working. Um, I think in, in many cases right now, everyone's operating with maybe a skeleton crew or, you know, just maybe some administrative duties taking place to, to at least keep things afloat until workers come back to a facility. And so I think the focus that I would have here as a business is not so much do we or do we not need to carry the, sh the insurance, but can we look at revising, you know, the exposures that it's, it's covering or the risk that it's covering, which is your employees, if we're talking about workers comp here. So, you know, look at revising your payrolls and job classifications if they've truly be, been impacted, if, if your employees are truly you know, laid off and they're not, they're no longer an employee at, at this time, and you don't plan on bringing them back for a few months, um, you know, revise your payrolls, maybe consolidate classifications, and then communicate that to the insurance company. That will help provide you know, some savings and, and some, some cost relief there, at least until you know which direction you're taking with bringing employees back or, or not. I, I would find it hard pressed that a business is in a position where they no longer need workers' comp insurance. There, there's probably some type of skeleton crew or a couple of employees from an administrative perspective still working. Um, but of course, if, if, if your business is taking a different direction, then, then you can go down that road. But I think in, for all intents and purposes, it's gonna be case by case, uh, keep an eye on what your, your statutory requirements are and, and probably look more towards uh, decreasing your payrolls and, and consolidating classifications and communicate that to the company. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to go back, hop back in the chat here, see if I can get some of the more of these questions answered. Um, I have somebody saying that in section 15-A, it says an individual able to medically tolerate a face covering must wear a covering in any public space. Does this not include the employees then, or is that, is that worded differently than you guys know, or how does that apply? Yeah. Um, well, I, uh, I can only tell you how I interpret that. Um, uh, so um, it's certainly possible that the state of Michigan or the governor's office may look at it differently. But mm -hmm. when I hear the term or see the term an enclosed public space, I read that to mean a place that is open to the public. And I generally do not view most workplaces uh, or at least areas in most workplaces as being open to the public. Certainly a shop floor wouldn't be. It's only uh, open and available to uh, uh, employees and visitors who have permission. But obviously, if it's a retail setting uh, or a service establishment or something like that, you know, that would be a place that would be open to the public, or at least certain areas of that facility or, or establishment would be open to the public. So that is how I have looked at it and guided my clients. Um, I can tell you, though, we've got other folks in the firm and in our, uh, the practice group that I am in who say, I'm not sure I would read it so narrowly. Um, and they have said, you know, we think this is a, it's at least a common area used by a lot of people. Um, so they, they have read that to say that that could be an enclosed public space. Now, um, the executive order also goes on to say that no one is punished for not wearing a face covering in an enclosed public place. Um, so that does sort of circle back to that issue I talked about earlier, and that is the executive order says you have to provide the face coverings to your employees, non-medical face coverings to employees, um, but it doesn't say you have to require them to wear them. Okay, hopefully that question is answered. Um, hopefully that answers your question, Mike. Um, so I had another question come in. If an employee is showing symptoms, gets tested, gets tested and it comes back negative, at what point can they return back to work? So the, um, there, there's, a, there's a couple of aspects to this, um, but the, the governor's executive order 2020-36, um, and I don't happen to have that in front of me, so forgive me if I misquote this a little bit. Um, it says they are supposed to return within seven days of when their symptoms first appeared uh, or three days from when their symptoms subsided. Um, and we read that to mean whichever is later. Um, uh, and um, if they in fact have tested negative, uh, then I think um, the CDC actually issued guidance um, 
two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, that said even folks who have symptoms or who have uh, tested positive, uh, once they are symptom free, are allowed to return under certain circumstances. Um, I don't happen to have the CDC guidance in front of me, but um, uh, they obviously have to wear a face mask. They have to abide by social distancing, uh, things like that. Um, so, you know, the, if the individual is so inclined and wants to come back, um, you know, I don't know that now that they've tested negative, uh, most employers would throw up a roadblock. Um, but the governor's executive order does give them a little bit longer to come back if they're so inclined. Okay. Awesome. And we did have a more in-depth question. We only have a couple minutes here, so I don't know if you guys need to hop off right away. Um, if not, if you don't mind staying a little bit and answering some more of these questions. Um, if a business calls back everyone, so if a business calls back everybody back to work, but somebody refuses due to safety concerns, how do they handle this? And then can a business tell the employee to stay home without pay or force them to use their vacation time? And then, or can they simply terminate that employee that refuses? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to this question um, because there could be a number of different, I'll say sort of safety concerns or reasons why an employee might not come back. Um, certainly if they have their own health issues, uh, they've tested positive, they're having symptoms, um, they have a compromised immune system, um, you know, those would all be reasons why, um, uh, they could stay off work and they would be eligible for paid sick leave under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, also, I would note that the, the, uh, the governor in one of her executive orders did expand the unemployment system to allow an individual in those categories uh, or, or who falls in those categories to collect unemployment, to leave work and collect unemployment. Um, that doesn't necessarily answer the unemployment issue, but it does give the individual the option of just saying, I'm not coming back. Um, so if there are health issues, you've got to kind of work through uh, some of those things. Um, if the individual says, well, I'm, I'm concerned that you're not abiding by all of the necessary precautions that an employer should abide by um, in order to return people to work, uh, one of the concerns we could have there is that, is that protected activity under the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Act. Um, basically, that statute says if the individual has a reasonable concern uh, for that uh, of an unsafe uh, or unhealthy condition in the workplace, they can object to that, they can voice their concern, and they can't be subjected to any sort of adverse employment action because of that. Certainly termination of employment would fit. Now, if somebody has not been back to work, I think it's pretty hard for them to say you're not abiding by uh, the various um, uh, requirements and expectations. But once they do return, if they come back and say, hey, folks are right on top of one another, you're not giving people masks, um, and, and you're, you've got no hand sanitizer, there's no soap in the restroom, whatever, well then you, you, know, you may have a, um, uh, an OSHA complaint issue, protected activity issue on your hands. Um, I think what we've tended to run into more often lately and these are very difficult situations to work through because there's a legal side to it and the employee relations side to it. The legal side is relatively straightforward, but the employee relations aspects are much more nuanced and complicated. But that is, what about the person who's just sort of freaked out about this whole thing and says, I don't want to come back. I don't want to leave my house. Um, I just don't think it's, it's the right thing to do or it's safe or you know, although Quinton tells me that we're a part of the critical infrastructure and that we're an essential business, you know, I just don't believe we are. So I'm not going to come back to work. Um, in that context, you, you do have a range of legal options. One would be to say to the individual, you have been offered suitable work. Um, and if you do not accept it, your employment will be terminated. Um, and under the unemployment statute, that should discontinue um, any unemployment benefits that they may be getting uh, if they are already on layoff or furlough or something like that. I say should because the unemployment system is so overwhelmed right now, it may take a while for that to actually happen and then it may take a while for them to actually work through the, the particular issues. Um, another option you have available is to leave them off work um, and require them to use PTO if it's available to them. 
Um, we do have a number of clients who did apply for and obtain paycheck protection program loans. So they actually have folks who are not physically working, but who are getting paid to stay home. Um, and they have said, well, we're ready now to start back up. So I want to call these people back. What happens if they don't come back? Uh, or for some reason they're uncomfortable coming back. And the tension that creates is if they terminate the individual, they run the risk of uh, reducing their FTE headcounts, which could have implications for whether their Paycheck Protection Program loan is forgiven um, because there's a sort of a measurement uh, period that goes along with that loan. Um, and they don't necessarily want to jeopardize the loan forgiveness aspect um, and so some employers have said, if you can give me some legitimate reason why you don't want to come back, I'm willing to let you stay off for some ex uh, additional period of time and continue to pay you. Um, other employers have said, I don't know how I look my other employees in the eye and say, you're here working, that person is staying home and they've got really no uh, legitimate reason to be home and I'm continuing to pay them. So th they've taken a much and said, you know, um, if you're going to stay off, you're either terminated or you're, tr you're not going to get paid uh, during this period of time. It, it's, it's, that's something you got to kind of work through in light of um, your situation. And again, if you're a recipient of a Paycheck Protection Program loan. Um, but as I mentioned, you can require them to use their PTO or vacation time, something like that. Um, and another reason that this becomes a little more complicated than it might otherwise at first seem is if folks um, say they do not want to come back for some reason, they don't feel safe, uh, they're at ill at ease with this whole situation, and you say, well, I'm sorry, you've got to come back, and if you don't, your employment is terminated, where does that leave you? Um, at some point, things are going to ease up, things will start to return to a more normal pace, and you're going to have fewer people um, uh, uh, you know, on your roles, if you will, to do the work. So net terminating somebody isn't always, while it, in the short term it solves a problem, it may create a, a bigger long-term problem for you that you have to be mindful of. So um, what I have tried to advise clients to do in situations where somebody is just sort of nervous about the whole situation is explain to them all of the things you're doing to ensure their safety and explain to them why what you do is important, not only to the company, the customers, their coworkers, their families, um, and see if you can some way, somehow uh, help to put their mind at ease. Um, and if they just dig in their heels and say, I'm, I'm not going to come back, you know, then, then you're really sort of at that fork in the road where you have to decide which way are we going to go with this person. Okay, right. And then before um, I ask any more of these questions, I did want to let everybody know that it is recorded and we can send over a recording if anybody needed to hop off now. And then I also wanted to just let everybody know that they should check out both of our websites, um, Warner Norcross and Sterling Insurance Group, because we both have a lot of information posted on there that could answer these questions as well. Um, I know Warner Norcross has a question of the day and I find it very helpful. Um, and then if you do have any questions and we didn't get to answer, just shoot me an email and then I will address it to who it needs to go to and then we'll be able to reply back to you with that question answered. So I just had a question come in. Does terminating an employee for refusing to come to work violate EO 2020-36? And that's the executive order that allows someone to stay off work if they have symptoms, if they have tested positive, um, or if they have been in close contact with someone who has symptoms or who has tested positive. And if, if those individuals are allowed to stay off work and the governor has said an employer may not take adverse employment action against them uh, while for, for being off work, um, but uh, there are time parameters associated with that. Um, really the longest one that I, uh, I think I can think of off the top of my head is gonna be 14 days from their last contact, uh, close contact with somebody who has had symptoms. So beyond that, if the individual does not come back, um, then uh, the executive order really doesn't preclude you from, from terminating them. But that, 
again, that executive order only applies to folks in those very specific situations, not just everybody. Okay. If, um, what happens if you encourage an employee who is ill at ease to return to work and they end up coming back to work and they end up contracting COVID-19 and they end up passing away, what is the liability? Um, well, generally a situation like that um, is going to be handled through the workers' compensation process. Okay. Um, uh, and, and in order to circumvent the exclusive remedies of the workers' compensation process, um, an individual has to be able to show that the employer knew with a virtual certainty that an injury or illness was imminent and they disregarded that risk. And, and as a result, the individual became ill or was hurt. Um, and that is obviously a very, very high showing um, uh, to make. And it is very difficult to, to sort of get outside of the workers' comp scheme. Um, and as morbid as this sounds, the workers' comp scheme does have a sort of a table that says, if a person dies, this is how much they're worth. Um, so that's kind of how that, that plays out. Um, now, having said that, we, we did see a flurry of lawsuits uh, a couple of weeks ago um, where uh, some, some of the big, I think, retailers, Walmart comes to mind, were sued uh, by um, employees or lawyers representing employees for having them work under what they thought were unsafe conditions. Um, so it's that age old uh, answer that lawyers love to give and that is well anybody can sue anybody but the big issue is can they win and again with the workers comp scheme uh in place it is very very difficult for someone to get outside of that and i would tend to think um it would also be very difficult for an employee to prove with a certainty that they contracted the virus at work um because it would entail them having to answer no to a whole host of questions like did you ever go to a gas station? Did you ever go to, to a shopping uh, center or Meyer or whatever? Did you ever talk to anybody in the last, you know, were you ever within a few feet of somebody who may have done any of those things? You know, you can see how the defense is going to line up uh, to, to establish that they can't prove with an absolute certainty this happened to me at work. It's much different than, you know, heaven forbid, the person whose hand gets pinched in a press or something like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that real quick, Robert. You know, we're seeing a lot of development there, state by state, again, at, at what state, what state intervention is going to say around, you know, did you co contract COVID at work and, and how is that going to be determined? It, it certainly seems operation by operation. They're looking at, you know, what, what are the risks of being, you know, obviously a, an employee in a medical facility versus a factory. There, there's just going to be different, um, you know, different uh, exposure there. And so, uh, we're seeing development pretty consistently on on how that's going to be handled because it it may be challenging to determine that you actually contracted it at work, but uh, that seems to be a consistent development. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and end it, and then I'm going to go ahead and take all the questions that we received in the chat that I, we didn't get a chance to end or to answer, and I will be emailing it over to everyone to get those answered, and then I will email each of you separately with those questions answered. Um, so I hope that everybody has a great day. I really appreciate Brad and Quinton, along with Norbert and Robert, joining us. Again, they are from Warner, Norcross, and Judd. If you have any questions, just reach out, and then I just hope that everybody stays safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.